on top. Okay, I'm coming in. Hello. I feel like I'm on the one show. Um, <laughs> on the sofa. <laughs> thanks everybody for, for joining this um, Selling Bercherita hybrid event from Bristol live. I'm very happy to uh, have Amber Carter in the office with us, who's going to be talking about her project that she's been doing alongside colleagues at the University of Edinburgh and also colleagues from Blue Ventures as well. But before I pass uh, the mic over to her, I just wanted to give some context just to set the scene a little bit and then hopefully make Amber's talk a little bit more, uh, yeah, make, make sense a bit more. Um, so as you may have guessed, this is about participatory video. What is participatory video? With the help of the next slide and um, artificially intelligent image generation, we have this toolbox on the beach in Madagascar that someone has carelessly left. And inside the toolbox is some of the tools that you'll be familiar with. Uh, these are some of the comms tools that we've been using as an organization for the last decade or more. Uh, and they include things you're all familiar with. I won't read them out loud. But in the top right-hand corner, you'll see film and video. And our work, like most uh, communication now, is moving towards video. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, kind of what, we're, what we mean when we talk about film and video in most of the work that we're doing. And I've categorized this as documentary type film and some of the things to consider whether or not they fit into that category. Um, firstly, this type of film and video is often authored, uh, and by authored I mean somebody has overall creative and narrative and editorial control, or a group of people have editorial control over something. So it's being designed and developed by, by an individual or a very small group of people, which we would call author in this case. Traditionally, our film and video work would have a very high concern with visual and audio quality, so we try and make things look and sound the best that we can. Uh, there may be a long editorial process, so um, maybe they've been scripted and planned uh, months before the filming has is, is gone underway, uh, and also after filming as well. There might be um, considerable editorial process in the way that that film is then crafted to suit our purposes. Um, and by that I mean it may or may not have an agenda, so the work that we're doing has an agenda in that we want to amplify the voices of small-scale fishers, we want to talk about the work that we're doing. So this authored work comes from that, that angle. And quite often um, this type of film and video may have multiple demands on it. So for example, if it's been paid for by a funder, then they might have particular requirements or expectations that clash with ours or clash with the community groups. So those sort of things need to be considered when we're talking about film and video, usually. Um, but how does participatory video differ? Uh, so it may or may not have any of those elements included, but the primary difference and the defining value when we talk about participatory video, which is shortened to PV often, is that it aims to pass full editorial and creative control to the community group, who are often the subjects of the film, and we want to give them the means to determine how they and their stories are expressed. And so it might be authored, it might have an agenda, it might have multiple demands on it, but ultimately the value that we want with participatory video, which differs from the other type of work we're doing, is that we want to give as much control as possible to the subjects. Next slide. Really quickly, um, some ways that we've been using it as an organization, and these aren't exhaustive, just a couple. Um, Firstly, it can be useful to help communities understand and identify issues that they're facing. Uh, and this is because if you can think about how to communicate an idea clearly, in this case using video, then quite often that can be a useful process to help you better understand uh, what's going on. Next. Um, you can use it to share ideas and tell stories and document change. And this is kind of the focus of Amber's work. Uh, and the idea behind this is by allowing community members to design, write, and produce a film themselves, they are able to determine the most authentic and appropriate way of communicating in context. And a classic example from BV is Tovo the Octopus Cleaner, the karate film. If you've not seen it, please do go, go and Google it. Uh, that's an example of this. And finally, uh, speaking to power. So 
often PV has been used to help marginalised and underrepresented groups who maybe have an advocacy aim or an advocacy concern to construct an argument, a concise argument that can then be presented in video form to community, uh, to authority figures. Um, this is old text, but I think it's still relevant. One of the reasons why we're interested in PV is because we have in the past committed to uh, qualitative as well as quantitative approaches to capturing community attitudes and perceptions. So while this language is old, I think it's still important. And last two slides, I think, if you can skip ahead. Um, Amber will go into more detail, I'm guessing, on how this worked in Madagascar, but PV is designed to be used by anyone. Uh, you don't have to have any experience with a camera. And this is me, a slightly younger, slightly thinner me, back in 2017, alongside a guy called Jiban who came from Nepal, and uh, he'd never used a camera before. And within four or five days, if you skip to the next slide, you'll see he's a, he's a semi-pro already, and he's, he's directing uh, short films. And you can see in the background to this interview some of the tools that are used to help develop PV stories and ideas. And I think that's it. Uh, I hope that made sense. It's very difficult not hearing anyone. <laughs> but um, I'm going to pass over to Amber, who's going to come and say hello and take control of the machine. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy. Brilliant. OK. All right, we get to go. OK. Hello, everyone in the room. Hello, everyone online. I guess I'm waving at the camera. Um, <laughs> thank you so much um, for inviting me, Matt, to um, do this knowledge session. I'm really, really excited to share with you um, about the Voices of the Vedo Participatory Video Project. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Matt, for that wonderful introduction to Participatory Video. I think it sets the scene really well and hopefully, um, yeah, it gives you more of an understanding of how I think participatory video could be a really, is a really useful tool. I know you're already using it um, for all areas of Blue, Blue Ventures work. Um, so yeah, this presentation is about the Voices of the Vaso project, which was a participatory video project, which kicked off uh, in October 2022. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the process and how yeah, participatory video can be used as a tool to engage and empower communities. So um, I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes and I'm going to go kind of introduce the project, um, talk about what my aims and objectives were for Voices of the Vaso, the planning process and the process, the participatory video process and steps. Um, some of the outputs that we've got from Voices of the Vaso, and I think the learnings and opportunities that I see from this project and all participatory video projects. So just to kind of introduce myself a bit and give a bit of understanding how I've ended up doing a participatory video project in Southwest Madagascar, um, I'm currently doing my PhD at University of Edinburgh. I'm in my final year. Uh, my PhD is focused on um, social and ecological issues around marine conservation in small scale fishing communities. So how marine conservation can be used to support not only biodiversity, but food security and uh, livelihoods. And unsurprisingly, that has been in partnership with Blue Ventures. I know that's you know, a very similar line. Um, so my PhD research has been focused in Southwest Madagascar um, for the whole four years. And so I've been able and lucky to use the Blue Ventures data that they've, you've been collecting since um, arriving in Madagascar all those years ago. And so how did I arrive at doing participatory video? Well, as I said, I've been doing my PhD kind of in partnership with Blue Ventures, so I had access to all this amazing uh, data and I was able to go to Madagascar at the very beginning of my PhD, which was great. Um, but then obviously COVID happened, the world shut down, I wasn't, no one was able to travel and it's always been a real motivation for me to try and make my research as relevant and useful to the communities as possible. Um, and because I was unable to go, because I was kind of unable to collect my own data, to kind of create, collect data 
to questions that I, I was really interested in, I started to feel really, really disconnected from the communities and really disconnected from actually what their concerns and what issues concern, concern them the most. And so when the kind of the world started opening up and I realized I could kind of um, go to Madagascar before the end of my PhD, I thought, I began to think, okay, what method can I use that kind of completely flips that narrative on its head? Um, and I kind of arrived at participatory video for all those reasons that um, Matt talked about, that it really is a method that allows um, the issues um, and the kind of narrative of the communities to be told um, authentically while kind of allowing me to collect some more data for, for research that will go towards my PhD. So kind of what was the overall aims and objectives of Voices of the Vaso? So um, yeah, as Matt mentioned, it's, you, it's one of the kind of uses of it is to document local knowledge. Um, and so in Madagascar, like throughout of much of the coastal tropics, uh, the marine ecosystem over the last generation has really changed beyond recognition. Um, and this goes undocumented throughout the world. And this, you know, this is due to the onset of climate change, um, overfishing, habitat destruction. And it's really the elders today in the communities that Blue Ventures are working in that have that memory of the ecosystems before kind of those real the onsets of those impacts. However, like their knowledge is disappearing. They won't be around forever. And so, um, OK, I'll carry on speaking while so carry on speaking while hopefully the computer catches up with us. Um, yeah, so that um, where, where was I? Yeah, so the elders have that knowledge of this change, but their knowledge is not going to be around forever. And so participatory videos are really um, kind of good way to document that knowledge um, through kind of through the eyes of the community. And that would also allow me to use the interviews that are done as part of this video as part of my research to look at the social and ecological changes in Madagascar over that timing of a generation. And so the other objectives, the second two um, beyond that, were kind of outside of uh, what would be relevant to my PhD. But I really wanted to make a project that to see like how can a participatory video create a platform to share stories and knowledge um, and how can it engage communities in, con in conversations around conservation, um, marine conservation issues. So kind of using it as a bit of a... Um, a, a pilot project to see um, how participatory video can be used in that way. So um, I've divided the process into eight different steps, and I think this would really vary on the context that you do the project in, um, but kind of for the sake of trying to describe as best possible um, how the process went, I've divided it like this. And you can see that number, there is no number eight, but number eight is a question mark. And that's because I think there's so many like potential uses for participatory video um, that it's really kind of what your aims are. Um, and you can see the arrows between two, three and four. Um, there's some arrows going back and that's because especially that part of the process, the training, the filming and the reviewing the footage, it's not particularly lin linear. You can um, you are kind of regularly going back to the one before, regularly kind of doing more training, doing more filming and reviewing until you kind of get the film that you're happy with. So I'm going to go through each of these steps now. Um, so, yeah, the first one, the planning, I guess this is quite a major step. Um, so, like, first off for me, the most important thing was having a partner and facilitator. So I always knew I was going to work with Blue Ventures. So that was kind of great. That was my partner on the ground that had that relationship with the communities. Um, and having a facilitator that knows the communities well and that communities trust. And that for, for Voices of the Vaso was Symphorian, um, who I hope is watching. Um, so Zinforian in the Andavadoc office was absolutely essential to this project. I see him as kind of the co-lead on this. So this is as much his brainchild as mine. So, um, yeah. So Zinforian um, was kind of the partner lead on this project. And he was um, essential at facilitating the, the, um, the workshops in the villages. Uh, the next thing to think about was equipment. So 
I thought about this kind of quite a lot about what equipment would, would, would work best. And I went for using um, smartphones as cameras, so iPhones. And this was after thinking about, okay, like iPhones have absolutely amazing quality uh, for the price and compared to cameras. So that was one reason I chose iPhones. Another reason is they're pretty hardy, so you can kind of drop an iPhone and it'll be okay if you've got the case on. And the third thing was that, you know, although in, in Southwest Madagascar, techno like te um, our access to technology is relatively low, people do have smartphones. So when they saw a smartphone, it wasn't a completely new piece of technology. It wasn't that scary. And I felt that gave people a bit of confidence from the offset, which was nice. Um, and then the other important bits of equipment, I would say, are your microphones, definitely kind of a wind, a wind cover on your microphone, um, a tripod, a, a um, frame for the, for the iPhone, and then your laptop to do the editing. Um, yeah, next to think about was kind of community relationships. And again, I had that with ReVentures, that was amazing, but it was, it was really important to have that we had that trust in place already. So we could go to the communities, we could speak to the president, and then we could speak to the youth group and get um, people that were interested in doing the workshops. And so for us, that process was quite quick. But I think if you're going into a bit, if you're going into a new place or a community you haven't worked with as much, that, that process will be important to, to not rush to make sure that trust is in place. Um, the workshop location and logistics, so making sure, really for us, that was making sure we had an inside area to host the workshop, um, like the training, and then the logistics. For us, it was, I mean, it was travel and also electricity, so making sure we had enough electricity, and if we didn't have enough electricity, if we, we had kind of power packs, that meant that we could keep using the cameras through the few days that we were in the village. Um, translation and production, so kind of figuring out a process of how, if, if you need to, of how those films are going to be translated into um, whatever language you want them to be in, and also that you have someone that is able to use whatever produc production software that you're going to use to get that film from the cameras, from the storyboards, onto the computer and out um, to share however you're going to share it. And finally, the calendar. So um, I think thinking about the calendar actually became quite important for us to make sure that we didn't exclude any, any groups of the communities that wanted to be involved in the film. So for example, we really had to, we had to think about when the seaweed um, harvest was and when the sea cucumber harvest was, because that meant that different groups weren't um, able to take part in the workshop or weren't going to be around for interviews. And we wanted to make sure that um, everyone uh, that wanted to have the opportunity to be involved. So that was just something else we thought about in the planning. Um, okay, next was the training. So this was when we all came together with the, uh, the participants in each, in, each, um, in each village. So we worked with six or eight um, youth from uh, the youth group in each village that we worked in. And the training um, kind of went on over two days in between, but they also did like filming and reviewing during that time. And we um, talked about camera skills, framing, the importance of B-roll, so the importance of not only um, shooting interviews, but like shooting scenery to um, give context to those interviews. We talked about interview skills, so, um, yeah, how to ask open-ended questions, kind of to not talk when they're giving their answer, all that sort of thing. Um, and then also a discussion of the topic. So the focus of these participatory video films were how the marine ecosystem has changed and that how that's influenced Vaso lives. So we made sure that we had a discussion um, with the group about that to see kind of where their knowledge was of that, what, what questions they were going to ask and things like that, just to make sure that we were all on the kind of same page about um, the focus of the films really. Um, yeah, and so next came the filming. So this is when we kind of really handed the equipment over um, and the youth that were involved in the, in, the, in the process went out, went into the village and um, did the interviews. 
Um, I think an important thing for this is that we, um, we briefed them, we kind of emphasised the importance of trying to speak to all members of the community. So we said equal amount of men and women. Um, and because the, the thing that we were interested in this film is how the marine ecosystem has changed, we kind of talked about, you know, the importance of speaking to all ages, particularly the elders. Um, yeah, and it was amazing seeing um, the groups go out and speak to all these different people, as you can see from this wonderful photo. Um, next in, I've realised that says three and it shouldn't say three, but the next um, stage is, was the review. So we did this like very regularly throughout the filming process. Um, and this helped us, this was when the group came back together um, to uh, review the footage that they'd been filming. And I think this was really important for a number of reasons. One, it allowed us as a group to watch the footage and it meant that um, whereas maybe when the group were filming the interviews, they were really focusing on the camera and, the, and the, making sure everything was good with the film. When we were doing the review, it allowed us to kind of engage more with the topic and discuss like what they've been learning. Um, it also allowed us as facilitators, Symphorian and I, to pick up on any like um, technical difficulties, if the group was having difficulties with sound or if they hadn't got the kind of camera settings quite right. It allowed us to kind of give a bit of extra training without having to be present through like the whole process. Um, because we did notice that when we were with the group as they were filming, it did impact like how they were relating to the community, how they were relating with the interviewers. So we tried to avoid that as much as possible, but by doing these regular review sessions throughout the filming, it helped us to, um, yeah, kind of give those pointers without, without um, giving too much, being too much in their way. Um, okay, so after all the filming was done, then it came to the group edit. So this is when the group came back together um, and you see we used paper and post-it notes and pens and they basically went through the footage and they created a storyboard of what they wanted their film to look like. Um, and so on the top row of the paper, we had um, the interviews and then on the bottom row, they would put what B-roll they wanted to put, but beware. Um, and some, even some of the groups on the interview said which part of the interviews they wanted to include, which order they wanted it to be in. We had it in kind of varying levels of detail. And then the next stage was putting their storyboards onto the computer. So um, in the Voices of the Vaso, we, we did this in four communities and because um, travel around Southwest Madagascar isn't always the easiest, we decided that we were going to share the films back with the communities while we were still in the village. So that meant we had to um, do the, the kind of computer edit, so get the film ready to share um, relatively quickly. So we, Symphorian and I would do that in a day. So after the workshop finished, we would take a day to create the film. Um, but then since we've started sharing the films online, that's kind of being a bit of an ongoing process because we've decided that we wanted to sharpen them up. We want to put the sub subtitles on. So that computer editing is still going on. But we did the kind of first cut that we shared with the communities directly um, in, in the one day. And uh, yeah, the group, sometimes they would be really interested in how, how it was. Um, we were doing the computer edit. So you can see that they're all um, they were all kind of keen to be involved. But yeah, we'd be doing it for the day. So at the end of the day, it was normally just me and me and Symphorian. <laughs> um, yeah, and finally the sharing. So we wanted to share the films with the communities as soon as we could um, what, and why we were in the village. So um, kind of at the end of the fourth day, we would have, or fourth or fifth day, we would have a cinema night. So we would show the film, the films that the, um, the youth groups have made. Um, the participants that made the films, they would get up and do an introduction um, and then we'd show some other kind of uh, music videos and things alongside that. So that kind of became a bit of an event. So, yeah, that was really nice. This photo is from um, Tampula Bay. And then we're kind of at the stage which we're at now, which is ongoing, which is the online sharing. So um, we 
uh, kind of aim of, for Voices of the Vaso was to make these films as accessible to not just the communities that we film them in, but all, all Vaso communities. So um, we've used Facebook, because that's really popular in Madagascar, and YouTube, and then um, Blue Ventures, you have been doing a great job of kind of taking and shortening some of the highlights of our films and sharing it on your social media. Um, so at the moment, we've just got one film online, but there are more coming um, very soon. So that process at the moment is ongoing. Um, yeah, so what were the kind of outputs of the project? Um, so we worked with 30 youth in four communities and over the course of two months we created seven short films so um, mostly two two films in each community apart from um one one in ampasalava the groups decided that they want to create they wanted to create one longer film um, we had four community film nights and they were attended the smallest audience i think was about 50 people um, but some of the larger audiences and couple of the village I, th I think was about 300 people so that was really exciting and then we have the Voices of the Vaso YouTube and Facebook where the films are being um, put online as we speak. Um, and so how is this going to relate to my research? So there were over, well, there were 90 interviews done as part of the filming. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm analysing those interviews to look at the themes and to how especially kind of themes of like how the ecosystem has changed and how that's impacted um, the communities on a social level. So yeah, the key interview themes that I've pulled out at the moment are... Oh no! <laughs> how, well, how long has that been gone for? Just a few seconds. Okay, just getting it back online again. <laughs> Sorry everyone. Okay, while we wait for that to load again, um, the key interview themes were declining catches, drivers of catch decline, the social consequences and impacts of catch decline, and solutions and actions. So that's very, very broad. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really rich um, insights and data in the interviews that we got, um, and it's really interesting to see what issues come up most, because potentially they weren't the issues or concerns that, as a research through my lens, I would have gone to first. Um, so yeah, that could be a whole other presentation, um, like kind of how these interviews can be used. Um, and so after each session, we did some feedback. We asked for feedback from the participants, the kind of positive and negative um, uh, views of, of the kind of whole process. In general, it was very positive. Um, common kind of things that we got fed back to us was they were kind of, they had learned a lot about kind of the traditions, about how the marine ecosystem has changed over the lifetime, particularly when they were speaking to the elders. Um, quite a few seem quite motivated to kind of share this knowledge with their village and particularly like share this knowledge with their children um, and um, we also got quite a lot of comments about how happy they were that they'd learnt these new skills um, in interviewing and camera and using a camera and what was really nice is that because um, Symphorian has the radio team in Andavadoc and that he, they are often out um, creating material in these villages that now, now um, you know, there's use in these villages with those camera and interview skills. Hopefully Symphorian can work with them in the future as well so they can carry those skills on. Um, and so the key, there was, this was my first kind of step into participatory video so there was a lot of learnings um, but I think I tried to pull some of the key ones out um, of what I kind of think was really important in the process. First of all was kind of providing enough support to the youth making the film while not kind of removing control or increasing biases. Um, and but yeah, there's a couple of ways we did that. I think really important was the regular review session. So you're kind of continuing to train and you're continuing to kind of give advice without um, kind of overtaking the process while it's actually happening. 
Um, reaching the quieter voices. So yeah, an amazing thing about participatory video is it does reach potentially the more marginalized and quieter voices in the community. However, you're still working within the social context of the group. Um, and so definitely kind of making sure you brief the group. For example, we brief the group on equal amount of men and women, getting all ages, kind of discussing with the different people that they could talk to. I think that was definitely important just to make um, everyone aware that um, it's, really, it's really good to kind of speak to as many different uh, groups as possible. The post-production logistics and translation. So Zinforian and I are in the midst of this at the moment. So we did do all the translation while I was in Madagascar. Um, now we're in the process of, of doing subtitles and um, putting that, um, doing the kind of final production on the films before they go online. Um, and don't underestimate how difficult that is, especially when someone, like when you're doing it on different continents and when someone has poor internet. Um, so yeah, that's definitely been uh, something that we've had to think about a lot. And I think just having that process in place as you're planning the project would be really good. And also flexibility. So I've kind of set out the process, but realistically it did, it did a change even within the context of the four communities we did in the Velandraki region. We had to adapt to the vibe, the, the atmosphere of the group, the skills and the motivation of the group and the place in the village. So just being flexible with your approach, I think is really important. Um, okay, and I think, yeah, final slide. I think there are so many opportunities for all areas with participatory video. Um, such things that kind of came out of this project was the opportunities at a local level. It's kind of community, real community engagement in a real kind of, kind of felt like in a real powerful way. Documenting and sharing local ideas and knowledge. So having those screaming nights was just really... I feel like it would have been an amazing way to kind of start discussions about certain topics and issues. Um, promoting leadership at a local level. So we had um, youth that took part in the workshops and some of them were um, so motivated and so interested in doing the interviews, doing the cameras in the issues. I felt like they could be the people that Blue Ventures end up working with in the future because they... Um, yeah, it was just really interesting how, um, or really amazing to see people kind of grow as leaders during the process and also increasing um, local awareness about the issues. So it was just a really great way to kind of communicate about those issues at a, in a way that's really relevant and authentic to the people that it's impacting. And then at a global or external level, kind of sharing those local voices and stories educating people outside of Madagascar about the issues that um, Vezu people are facing, raising awareness. And I think if, if this is your plan, like if this is an aim, this can lead to ad advocacy um, to, about those issues. Um, and yeah, so, so, so many more, I think, that I can't um, list now. Okay, and before I end, I'm going to try and share a little preview of the uh, next film that's going to come online. So I hope this works. Online viewers, I hope this works okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to start sharing. And I'm going to... And then I just play it with my sound off. And we're going to all cross our fingers. Vata, 
fasana na keti fanu fanu puna na zefa fata dua zau sia ni sira zeze kita na bu fala fata uta turu hengi na du tu kuak la lanzar ni muka na hengi vat fada reu teu ya bina anti kaha mena ma surai zaka kreu zetra teu. Taruha sirani si zau la tika harata tadira nu zau. Harata hafu sa vau, zau tita luha. Ka tita luha, tsiraha nana masige. Fa mangiri ke ami zau vau sa tia tifia tita luha, raha ni maru. Ka zai manente bau vau fai tawa tifia ingi. Fia au tami zai, a, imu ala hati raha nani simpi viri tita luha fai, fai venzanga vau ande se manga manumbu. Hila tsaku, tsiraha seni tsiraha, udu ni viri fia tita luha, fai ila ala hati raha takadu fisa kafu. Amanu bangga bau. Ah, lah fandi ni aku ada tena cakap tifi yang kita dua, rata tifi yang anak. Ah, lah suri suwa atau cika dua. Aleu tante lah fah bau jadi sabar hamil hamil nanti kas. Kita si terana ke lambat atau boleh jadi review. Ah, sampai hisya bau lahirun pas sampai mama hari sa, bau sasi tiana kah bau. I'm glad that worked. Oh. <laughs> Go back to this. Yeah, so that was just the beginning of, um, is this sharing? Yeah, it's going to share. That was the beginning of uh, one of the films from Ambata Malou. Um, and I think just, yeah, some really special imagery and a really nice interview there to kind of show uh, what Pottery video can do. Um, yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to say a big uh, thank you to Blue Ventures in Madagascar and here to like helping me and being so supportive and helpful for this project. Symphorian, who is the other co the co lead on this project, couldn't have happened without him. Um, yeah, and all the all the all the youth and the communities that were involved in the videos because um, went better than I could have imagined. So yeah, thank you. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Amber. That was really, really interesting. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, as Timo has done, please do either raise your hand and we'll get you saying it live, or you can ask it in the Q&A um, tab. Uh, I've got one question online, which we'll go to first, and then we can see if there's anyone in the room or virtually. Um, so Timo says, comment first, Really interesting to hear your reflections about how the existing relationship between the villagers and Blue Ventures influenced the work as a gatekeeper and securing trust. He'd be interested in hearing a bit more about how you feel your own positionality could have influenced and shaped the PV process and outputs. I can just speak, yeah. Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think... That, yeah, there is no denying that my own, my positionality and my presence like, impacted the um, videos because I think, I mean, it was, it was me, it was my idea, it wasn't something coming from the community and it was kind of a focus that I created. So although the issues and the concerns within that topic that were coming up were community led, it was me that was that and Symphorian that were kind of guiding that topic. Um, so yeah, I think there is an undoubtedly an impact and I th think we were, in, t in terms of what, we what we heard being said, we definitely, yeah, throughout the process, kind of making sure we were, um, particularly as the filming was taking place, really taking as much of a step back as possible and just letting the group have, you know, a decent amount of time, hours, independently to go and do um, the filming and the project, I think we were trying to reduce our influence as much as possible. Um, but there is no denying that, yeah, the, it, it did probably impact um, the, the videos in many, in many ways. We try to be aware of that as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any questions in the room? Oh. Three, three oh. questions. Martin first. Thanks, Amber. That was amazing and incredible to see. I mean, 
incredible imagery, but the videos and stories that are coming as well is hugely powerful. I'm really interested in consent and mm. how much you talk to the participants about that and how much they then talk to the people who are interviewing about that and understandings of sharing this on YouTube or whatever and, and those sorts of issues, if you have any reflections on that. Yes, that was a good question. And um, I, I was um, umming and ahhing whether to include that in the talk, actually, and I pretty should have because it's a really important point. Um, we, I, talked, I had to think, firstly, a lot about consent because it was a research project, I had to get it past the ethics at University of Edinburgh. So already that was kind of um, something I thought quite deeply about before it started. And I, and I talked with them. And I mean, it is such a um, kind of not black and white subject with video. Um, so we made sure that we briefed part of the training process was briefing the participants on consent and talking about how important it is that they spoke to each of the interv the people that they were interviewing before they started to make sure that they knew what was going to happen with this footage, um, to make sure that they knew it was going to um, be shared online, it was going to be seen by the communities. Um, so in, in terms of kind of with the interviews that what we did and then there's also the kind of um, discussion about ownership because participatory video is meant to be like a co-led co-production co of knowledge so we um you know said that said to the we said to the participants that they would have access to all this footage and all these videos so the the footage is in madagascar and then once we have all the films we said that we were going to um we are going to um, provide USB sticks to each of the, the people that took part and the communities and have them in the Endeavour Doc office so hopefully that that footage is available to them um, should they want it. Um, yeah. Thanks Emma, great uh, presentation again and so many questions to ask on a follow-up so maybe you can come back at some point. I'm really interested in the social side of things and particularly the difference between the understanding of the ecosystems between the elders and the younger mm. people. What kind of key differences did you see? What were the key drivers and sort of explanations as to why this change has happened? And a bit of a complex question, but did you think they were completely disconnected? The elders had one version and the youth had a second, or is the understanding sort of passed on to the next generation? Good question. I'll, I'll go with the first bit first, the, the second part of the question first. No, I don't think the understanding was between the, the kind of younger generations and older generations were completely disconnected. However, there was some um, differences in, um, what should I say? Some of the knowledge had been lost down the generation. So they, like the elders were telling stories about what the marine system, ecosystem had been like, what the fishing techniques used to be like, that the the youth that took part in the workshops then reported back to us that they were learning for the first time. So yeah, it kind of demonstrates that that, that knowledge is being lost down the generations. Um, I mean, the, the key things that we heard were just the um, stark decrease in the amount of fish that are compared to that, what there used to be. Um, and that will be like a whole part of this project for me. It's like, yeah, what can we um, tell from these interviews about how the ecosystem has changed? So, yeah, kind of a de decline in catches was, was the main story. And uh, the reasons for this, lots of reasons were given. Lots of people, an increase in the amount of fishing gear. So whereas villages used, used to have one or two nets between everyone in the village, now everyone in the village owns several nets, or most people in the village will own a net. Um, uh, destructive fishing techniques, um, so like the use of um, kind of breaking coral when people were gleaning, the, the use of uh, poison fishing, the use of other kind of um, small, smaller mesh size nets came up a lot. Um, yeah, I think those were the kind of key, three key ones. <laughs> Cool. I've got one more question. Thanks, Amber. Um, so it's a, it's a question around the selection process when it came to the, the participants. Mm. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a PV workshop. And so I know how 
fun and interacting, um, interactive and engaging they can be once they've started. Um, but building that enthusiasm and getting people to turn up and to um, come away from their day to day livelihoods mm. to take part in a multi day workshop can often be a bit of a challenge to get people in the room to begin with. Um, so just wondered if you had any advice or any insight into that selection process and whether you had any challenges or successes there. Mm. Um, so we, yeah, we work with the youth groups. So like the youth groups in, in this region are generally people between 20 and 30 that are really in, kind of engaged in um, community issues. So we were lucky there that we already had some motivated people and we would speak to the youth group leader in in some villages actually the one of the villages the president wanted it to be kind of half the group from the youth group and half from outside the youth group so that was nice because we got kind of maybe inclusion of people that might not otherwise have been involved um in terms of like encouraging people um we i mean i because this was it well because people were taking time out their day i get i paid people that took part and that, I mean, that helps because um, if they were not going to take part because they might have been able to go fishing and make some money or go gleaning, then um, I was kind of replacing that lost, that lost revenue. So, um, yeah. Uh, any more questions in the room or online? Give people a few minutes. Uh, I would like to know what was your most enjoyable memory from doing it and also what was the least enjoyable oh. moment of it? Um, I think they're the same thing, actually. The most enjoyable memories are the community film nights when, especially like the one, the big ones with like 300 people where the whole community is like watching um, something that the youth have just produced and, and when everyone's seeing like people that they know be interviewed and um, that was amazing. But at the same time, they were the most stressful things because um, yeah, we were setting up like cinemas um, with generators and with speakers that weren't working and um, you know, getting the sound right and all that was quite stressful. So yeah, I think both times was the uh, cinema nights. And I think one of my other highlights is whenever the films included music, like he was so amazing, Jose, the um, guitarist that um, was in the beginning of that clip. And he just had like a whole album of songs about marine conservation that he just kind of performed for the, for the participants of the youth group. So kind of discovering people like him was, was absolutely incredible. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. I uh, got a, a comment from Timo online that says, a uh, quick plug for the PV work that Juan Bao, uh, our partner in Tanzania, has been doing as well. And he's shared a link there, so um, do check that out. Uh, final call, Zola. Yeah, thank you, Amber. Um, for me, is uh, just thank you. I'm a visual woman from mm. Madagascar, from the Southwest. And also just like those things has been done by the, our outreach group for more than 10 years. So mm -hmm. you are adding another layer, which is great. And um, just want a little note is the this knowledge, we don't lose it. Mm. We share it mm. by generation mm. to generation as me. Mm. I heard it from my grandparents. So mm. it's something that we always transmit to another generation. Mm. So glad that you have it together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ola. Okay. Um, oh, we have a question online, potentially. Uh, let's see if we can, Ryan, do you want to unmute and I'll mute here and uh, Aina, do you want to go ahead? Uh, 
as we can talk is uh, voices of the um, There are many, many issues that uh, we talk about in the films, but if uh, you have to say just one thing, what uh, would be the biggest issue uh, of the Bezu? Um, okay, so the first question, why South of Madagascar? Um, that was because it is the, been the focus of my PhD research and this project was part of my PhD. Um, and, I, and it was, yeah, so it was a place that I've been um, working, uh, with, well, yeah, since, since the start of my PhD. So that, that's how South of Madagascar was chosen. Um, what do I think the main issue for uh, that came out of the films? Um, it was a, yeah, declining catches and then a lack of um, alternatives to fishing. So people expressed a lot of um, a lot of desire to be able to do something else, but they didn't have the other opportunities to. Um, that wasn't that to not go fishing. So I think that was kind of a key theme that runs throughout the films. Brilliant, thank you. I think we'll end it there. Um, subscribe on YouTube and f like on Facebook and also follow <laughs> Amber on various social medias and also email if you're old school. Uh, thanks Amber. Thank you, thank you everyone.